World Water Week 2021 was made possible thanks to our partners. Welcome to World Water Week 2021. I'm Alok Jha. I'm your master of ceremonies for this event. I'll accompany you for wherever you're participating from in the world on this journey to find the ideas and solutions we need to build a resilient world. I'm a science and technology correspondent at The Economist. I'm also the author of the Water Book. As a journalist, my passion has been to tell the story of water. I wrote the book to make us all change the way we look at water. This extraordinary substance that connects everyone to everyone else and everything in the universe, but water is so ubiquitous and common that many of us essentially forget that it exists and we ignore it. With my book, I wanted to change the way people understand and ultimately value how water is. World Water Week is very much a reflection of the connective power of water today. It's the world's leading conference of water and all areas of life that rely on water, which is pretty much everything. We're so happy that you've joined us. World Water Week started in 1991 as a big celebration. 30 years ago, the city of Stockholm used to organise an amazing water festival to celebrate how the city had managed to clean up its watersheds, which used to perhaps be one of the most polluted in Europe. But the city thought it might be a bit too much fun, so they also introduced the Stockholm Water Symposium and invited the world's leading water scientists to Stockholm. Over the years, World Water Week has really taken off. It's now one of the leading global events on water. It provides the stage for numerous events and collaborations, which have led to important advances in the understanding of and protection of water. Now, this year, due to the COVID pandemic. World Water Week is a fully digital conference. That means that for me, I'm connecting to you from a green room in Stockholm. Now let's go back to the virtual studio. As a science and technology journalist, it's my job to be amazed by human innovation. Now the pandemic prevents us all from getting together in person here in Stockholm, so we've created this exciting virtual space for us. But what exactly is going to be different this year? What can we expect from this year's World Water Week? The person who can answer that is, of course, Tony Holmgren, the executive director of the Stockholm International Water Institute, and the organizer of World Water Week. Tony, welcome. Nice to have you on stage. Thank you for your introduction, Alok, and thanks for those magical photos you just showed. Photos of your beautiful city, yeah, yeah. Stockholm. Um, now, tell us, Tony, what's going to be different? In 1991's World Water Week to 2021's World Water Week, spontaneous, I would say, the clothes. But no, actually, it's the the, the diversity and the World Water Week nowadays is a truly global conference. This year, we will have participants, thousands of participants from more than 150 countries uh, attending. If I compare to 1991, we had uh, 200 scientists working or meeting for two days to discuss freshwater issues. What is also amazing is that nowadays we have more or less a gender balance in the attendance, more or less as many women as men, and also a huge increase in number of youth taking part in the World Water Week. Well, two years ago, when we met physically, we had 35% of attendees were under age of 35, and I think that this year we begin in more diverse and even bigger compared to uh, in 1991. Now, talking of diversity, there, why do you think it's so important for the institute and for the conference itself to have such a diverse、um, set of voices? Well, I think collaboration is what we need today. We need to undergo massive transformations in our society. If we are to tackle climate change, as the IPCC report so bluntly told us two weeks ago, we need to collaborate. That is the same thing with stopping biodiversity loss and also eradicate poverty. Well, in a matter of fact, if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals, we need to work together with people from different background and different uh, uh, knowledge, and that is the key of the World Water Week. And also, what is also changing from 1991? At that time, the, the scientists met to discuss the water cycle. 
Now we have a much broader uh, uh, program that is covering water aspects in climate, energy, food production, transport, etc. So that is also something that we need people with different backgrounds, different knowledge and experience to come forward with. Uh, joint solutions. Now, joint solutions, uh, different backgrounds, different knowledge. I mean, that's something that really speaks to me as a reporter. I know yeah. that speaking to NGOs, speaking to academics, speaking to government actors, mm -hmm. to get the full picture is always the best mm -hmm. story. Let's turn to the theme of this yeah, year's yeah. Water Week, building resilience faster. Tell me more about that. Yeah. No, I think over the last year, a lot of people around the world had changed their mindset about uh, the world that we're living in our societies. Of course, a number of people have lost loved ones to COVID and a number of people have fallen into poverty. And many people have also experienced unbelievable heat waves, droughts and also floods and that hadn't like, experienced before. I think I can learn or we can learn two lessons from this. Number one is that... Uh, well, our societies are very vulnerable to things that happen nowadays and we need to find ways to handle that in the future because my second lesson is that these extreme weather events to a large extent are related to water, connected to water, too much or too little water and that is what we're going to discuss and that is why we need this collaboration among people with different backgrounds and experience and knowledge. Let me also quote uh, Sir David Attenborough who has claimed that this decade is the decisive decade for humanity to undergo massive transformation and the time period we have to do that is quite limited. So we have to start now. And that is what we would like to invite people from all over the world come to discuss from the water aspect, this uh, massive transformation that is needed in the society in the future. So the conversation around water has never ever been more important. Togni, thank you. Thank you. Now, building resilience is one of the most crucial tasks at hand today. And I look forward to following the many sessions of World Water Week to understand how it can be accomplished. We'll talk again soon about how World Water Week 2021 is designed to achieve that. But first, we want to learn a bit more about the challenges we're facing and what we need to do to build resilience faster. Let's hear from the Swedish Minister of International Development Cooperation, Mr. Per Olsen Fried, whose role is crucial in helping to build resilience in many vulnerable parts of the world. He's previously served in government positions on the environment and climate and culture and democracy. Now, since he is based here in Stockholm, we were able to meet him outside this studio. Minister Olsen Fried invited Siwi's Jennifer Jun to one of his favourite waterfront spots in Stockholm for a walking conversation. Let's listen in. in a beautiful and serene waterfront area southwest of the city center of Stockholm and I'm delighted to be joined by the Swedish Minister for International Development Cooperation, Minister Per Olsen Fried. So tell us a little bit about Vinterviken and uh, do you have any special significance for this place? Well during the course of history this place Vinterviken has been transformed from an industrial uh, area with the experiments and innovation of, of Alfred Nobel. I mean, his factories are just uh, surrounding us right now uh, into a recreational area where families, people of all ages come to, for leisure to, to spend time, uh, to swim, to go kayaking or, or, or just uh, for, for an evening walk. But the pandemic has shown us that without nature, without these spaces, as you say, these green or blue spaces, there's, there's, you know, this is so important for us, for our well-being, for our mental health, for our physical health. And I think we have, again, revalued the importance of having nature close to us. In that spirit, shall we take a walk? Yes, please, this direction. So, Minister, how important is the environment and particularly water for Sweden? And how is this reflected in the Swedish development agenda? Well, I think to us with... Uh, so long and beautiful shores and you know tens of thousands of lakes uh, water uh, and access to water is, is is an element of every every swedish person's life 
So in your view, how do we best build resilience? Resilience is the word to use. To build resilience and to make sure that there is resilience among people and in nature, uh, I think that's our best chance. Let's not forget the importance of, of transforming, ensuring sustainability in the blue economy so that we can also create jobs needed to ensure a just transition. Uh, but the blue economy is of course key to create sustainability around oceans and, and, and water. Next year, in 2022, we will host the Stockholm Plus 50 conference to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the very first conference on the human environment. But we also then need to use this conference uh, next year uh, as a means to accelerate uh, the important work that we now have to do to protect nature, to protect our oceans, to protect water. Uh, and again, to, to renew our relationship with nature. And we will do that by focusing on the SDG on consumption and production because it involves all elements um, that is important at this stake. This is happening under our watch. We're losing this planet very fast under our watch and it doesn't have to be that way. But to take that responsibility, we need to act now. Uh, and I hope that the conference next year can, can help us do that. If we don't protect water, if we don't protect nature, we can't protect people. Let's put people and planet at the center of our endeavors. Thank you, Minister Olsen Fried, for making it so clear what's at stake in terms of building the resilience of people and the planet. And Stockholm plus 50, it sounds like 2022 will be a very exciting year for this city. We now turn to a leading voice in the United Nations, the Deputy Secretary General, Ms. Amina Mohamed. She is one of the key architects of the Sustainable Development Goals. Today, she works tirelessly to ensure that the world is on track to meeting these goals by 2030, including the goal on water and sanitation, goal number six. I had the pleasure of speaking with her earlier about the 2030 Agenda and how it can help guide our way to building resilience faster. Let's take a look. Ms. Mohamed, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, can I just ask you about your experiences uh, as a government minister in, in Nigeria? You were the Minister of Environment there. I just wonder, how does that uh, shape your views on sustainable development? Well, much of the views that I have that uh, were shaped on sustainable development were through the process of um, shaping the 2030 agenda, those 17 goals. Landing in Nigeria was sort of the proof of this does work on the ground. Um, and so as Minister of Environment, facing um, environmental challenges of biodiversity, climate action, pollution, and then the context of demographics, of conflict, um, all of that came very much alive. And so really just uh, for me, um, uh, a firm endorsement that we needed to think about that paradigm shift of uh, moving from just a part of a development agenda to an integrated one. So a really unique experience in that you set the goals as well as trying to implement them and, and having government experience as well. It's, it's quite a unique set of experiences. Um, you mentioned the 2030 agenda just there. Um, can you tell us um, where we are as a world in trying to achieve those global goals? Well, first, the agenda is universal. It's really quite ambitious. I and mean, as I said, it really is an integrated response. The economy is at the center, but how it becomes inclusive, plays for the basic services um, and, and rights that people um, aspire to um, is a challenge. Uh, for where we are today, um, we, before COVID, were off track. After COVID, even more so. It has exacerbated many of the issues around uh, water and sanitation, uh, in particular poverty, inequalities. Um, it, the burden's fallen mostly on women. Um, and then, you know, as we see the investments that are needed uh, to, to really uh, pull the transitions that may be green for, the, for, for, for our economies um, as we look at climate action, uh, all these have not come as we had expected. Um, so not doing well. But having said that, we do see that there is an opportunity for the world in the response to the crisis, both health uh, and socioeconomic of COVID, uh, that the recovery piece uh, could get us back on track. There is a silver lining there. There are things that we can scale up. Uh, there are things that we can put more at the center of the investments um, that we're asking for now. 
Now, let's zoom out a bit. How does goal number six on water and sanitation, how does it relate to the other sort of broader 2030 agenda? Just could you give us some context about how goal number six fits with the rest of the agenda? Uh, in much the same way that I talk about gender, um, each one of these goals, um, if you put it at the center, you can see that it is critical for socioeconomic development, healthy ecosystems, human survival itself. Um, and so here again, um, if we say, if we didn't have access, for instance, to water and sanitation, how could we have ensured um, not just the healthy lives, but the pandemic itself and the spread um, of the virus? Um, if we are speaking to um, our biodiversity, um, we need to look at restoration. Um, and so the water uh, bodies and reserves that we have that could feed not only um, just uh, perhaps the food systems, but also have find that balance between um, our climate action and people um, is another area that I think that we would need to enhance um, that protection uh, in, in climate tech change uh, mitigation. But we also know that the global water demand for use has increased. And so um, we have to think carefully of urbanization and how um, that's going to be designed as we go through, um, especially when we're seeing um, climate change. Um, and so therefore, uh, water is depleting in many, many uh, countries and, and regions. Um, how to find that balance um, and to make sure uh, that we use water as a, a crucial building block. Well, human imagination is clearly the solution to a lot of these problems, hopefully. Um, final question for you, uh, Ms. Mohammed. Um, can you complete this sentence for me? A resilient world in 2030 looks like what? What does a resilient world look like to you? Um, a resilient world 2030 is where um, the human being and the planet will find um, a balance in which we can all thrive and survive. That was very crisp, and that was uh, that was exactly what we needed. Thank you very much for all of that. Uh, thank you very much, Mas Mohammed. Thank you so much, Alok. It's a pleasure meeting you and and uh, speaking with you. Now, after listening to Minister Olsen Fried and Deputy Secretary General Mohammed, it's a bit clearer what's at stake on a global level. We're dealing with some very, very complicated global challenges. Building resilience faster, the theme of World Water Week, is clearly going to be a big task. So let's hear some thoughts from someone who's been thinking about exactly that theme for some time, the head of World Water Week, Henrika Thomason. Henrika, welcome. Thank you, Alok. It's great to be here. Now, what did you take away from those videos of Minister Olsen Fried and Ms. Mohammed? What messages do you think we should learn? Well, it is really important with these messages from governments and intergovernmental organizations how it is rapidly becoming the new norm to want to decarbonize by 2050 and to protect the natural world. But I think, and I know that many think so with me, that now we must go from words to action. We must build resilient societies for everyone, especially the poorest. Okay, so let's think about what we can do then. What's the role of World Water Week? How is this conference and this group of people going to con contribute to this challenge of yours to build resilience faster? Well, to be honest, I am a bit intrigued by how blind we often are to water. We hear about and even experience existential threats such as the climate crisis, and it does show up as droughts, floods and rainstorms. And still we fail to see that that is about water. So water needs to become top of mind for everyone. It provides solutions. But it's not only about water. So we do need city planners, climate researchers, water experts, energy people, you name it, to come together and craft more resilient and more fair societies. So World Water Week can contribute by setting the stage for such co-creation. So all of those people you've mentioned, they're all experts. Is this a conference just for experts? Well, if you look at the challenges the world faces today, we can't solve them without a joint effort. So all sorts of experts are needed. We can't work in silos. So 
we want to see World Water Week as an action platform engaging all. So we can look forward to a week of intense collaboration then. Thank you, Henrika, and I look forward to speaking to you later in the programme as well. Thank you. One of the impacts of the COVID crisis is that more and more people are paying attention to science. Climate change, for example, has become a much more mainstream topic in our news cycles. The huge international spotlight given to covering the latest IPCC report on the state of the climate was encouraging. One of the main conclusions of the IPCC report was that climate change is intensifying the global water cycle. We know that this is indeed happening all around us. All you have to do is turn on the news. To help us better understand the science behind climate change, we'll now hear from Professor Johan Rockström of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. He's one of the world's leading scientists on the impacts of climate change. We met him earlier at the Potsdam Institute in Germany. Let's listen in. So dear colleagues and friends at the World War II Week, no talk about climate crisis and water crisis can start without sharing first the most important scientific message to humanity over the past 30 years, namely the evidence that we are leaving the Holocene, the interglacial equilibrium state that supported civilizational development over the past 12,000 years, and we're entering a whole new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. We humans are now the dominating force of change on Earth. We are in the driving seat and the hydrological cycle, the bloodstream that interacts with all the function of the Earth system is fundamental to our future and the stability on Earth. We have more and more evidence of how freshwater systems are being impacted in the rapid changes that we're causing in both climate and biodiversity and changes in all the living and non-living natural systems here shown from the GRACE uh, satellite data of how we have floods and water scarcity and changes in big water systems around the world occurring already today. I don't have to list for you the 2020 occurrences and what we've seen so far in 2021. We are in a phase where we're seeing amplifications caused by human-induced climate change attributed generally in terms of the extraordinary forest fires in early 2020 in Australia with the devastating impacts on humans, economy and ecology. But also, of course, what we're experiencing right now in British Columbia with the extreme heat waves, forest fires, hitting humans, hitting ecosystems, hitting economies. The most important insight is that we've crashed through the warmest mean temperature on Earth since we left the last ice age. This is a point where we are leaving the stability domain of the Earth system as we've known it since we started our civilizational journey some 10,000 years ago. On the second half of this talk, however, I want to move away from what's happening today. I want to focus in on this little blue marble taken from the Apollo 8 shot of Earthrise, showing what a little beauty this piece of home is with all its fresh water, but also how fragile it is alone there at the margins of the universe. The challenge is that scientifically, we are today for the first time forced to explore the following question. Are we at risk of destabilizing the entire Earth system? What you see on this graph here is the first time a climate model run with the knowledge we have on physics and mathematics of the biophysical operations of the Earth system is reproducing the cycle of glacial period and interglacial periods, the journey of our planet during the last three million years. So what you see on the x-axis here is the quaternary on the y-axis global mean temperature. Of course, we've had quite significant natural variability. This is climate forcing from solar radiation primarily. But at no time during this entire journey has the planet, as far as we know, exceeded two degrees Celsius. The planet has stayed within a very narrow corridor. Warmest point, less than two degrees. Coldest point, deep ice age, minus four to six degrees Celsius. That is what I call today the corridor of life. So one year ago, we published the latest updates on the state of the climate-related tipping elements that regulates the state of the climate system. Of the known 15 system, nine, which you see on this map here, are showing signs of instability, moving potentially towards tipping points. These nine are deep concerns and all of them linked to freshwater. 
But moreover, what we are starting to see indications of is that they are interconnected, shown here by the arrows. So what happens in the Arctic, for example, with the rapid melt of the Greenland ice sheet and the Arctic summer ice releasing fresh water into the North Atlantic, is slowing down the so-called AMOC, the heat conveyor belt in the North Atlantic, which in turn is impacting on the South American monsoon, which increases droughts and forest fires and release of greenhouse gases and undermining and degrading the forest systems. But it's also locking in and, and holding more warm surface water in the Southern Ocean, which can explain the accelerated melting of some of the West Antarctic ice shelves. And we know that altogether, this raises sea level rise projections, potentially with another meter, even over the next one to two centuries, causing massive potential threats to all coastal zone communities across the world. So here we have a situation of very rapid changes already today. Well, Science Forward is, is verifying this. Here you have publications on the AMOC slowdown. Here you have papers showing the evidence on tipping points in the Amazon rainforest. We have more and more papers on the melting on West Antarctica. All of this gathers together to the projections into the future. If we pass two degrees Celsius warming, we will have, as you see, large parts of Southern Africa, Southern Europe, Western US, South America, losing more than 25% of its rainfall. Massive implications for human beings and therefore also for geopolitics around the world. So I'd like to leave you with this at the World Water Week this year, that fresh water must be integrated within the climate agenda. We're talking of a transformation expressed here by the fact that we need to meet the sustainable development goals by 2030, but then transform towards a safe and just future within planetary boundaries. That the sustainable development goal framework, the 17 goals that we've all agreed upon, must be understood as, 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 as a unified framework expressed here by the so-called wedding cake, which shows the four non-negotiable sustainable development goals, the goal on fresh water, biodiversity, oceans and climate that form the planetary boundaries within which we can have and should have aspirational goals for social, economic, just and prosperous development. And this is the new framework for sustainable development where freshwater plays a fundamental role in guiding our future on Earth. So good luck with the deliberations at the 2021 World Water Week. Thank you, Professor Rockstrom, for providing us with such a clear scientific picture of where we are today and where we need to go in terms of strengthening our resilience against the impacts of climate change through water. Let's take a moment now to see how Water Week will go. You'll all be relieved to know that I'm not going to take you through all of the hundreds of sessions we're having this week. That would leave you with no time to actually attend the sessions. But to help you plan the week, I would like to share a little of what we'll be offering here on the centre stage, in addition to more than 400 sessions convened by different organisations. The centre stage is where we'll meet for the opening and closing, and that's also where you'll find the award ceremonies that you absolutely should not miss. Tomorrow, you'll meet the 44 finalists of this year's Stockholm Junior Water Prize, and you can hear Her Royal Highness Crown Princess Victoria's announcement of the winner. On Wednesday, there'll be more royal festivities and academic excellence when His Majesty King Carl Gustav XVI presents the Stockholm Water Prize. But these aren't the only things happening here on Centre Stage. Starting soon after the opening today, you're all invited to our talk show, Sea We Corner, which will be screened twice daily and feature a range of fascinating guests. And don't miss the accelerators, which will dig deeper into leadership in business and communications and behaviour change. And if you get tired of all the words, well, in the more than words sections, we explore other ways to communicate. So, you have a lot to look forward to in the coming week before we meet again for the closing plenary on Friday. Now, I know that was a lot to take in. So while you all think about how to plan your World Water Week, let's take a break for some musical inspiration. We have for you some very talented young artists from Sweden, Arcadia Hugosin Miller and Clara Headoas Schmidt, who are going to perform for us a song that they've written specially for World Water Week. Arcadia, Clara, welcome. Thank you. It's really nice to have you both here. Can Thank I ask you... you this song you've written for us, what's the name of it? It's called Come My Way. And the inspiration, where did it come from? 
So we wrote the song um, inspired about the state of the world today and how scary the future can feel. Um, but then also, you know, just dreaming about what we could accomplish if we work together for a better future, basically. Uh, there are so many people coming to this conference they are going to be hopefully inspired by your song. Mm -hmm. I'd just love to know what you would love people to take away from it once they've heard it. What's the, what's the thing you want them to be inspired by? So we wanted to encourage people to feel hope um, and dare to take action. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to convey. Well, thank you very much for being here. Thank and you. while we set up the studio for the song, um, we wish you could all be here with us, but unfortunately you can't. So um, whilst we set up the studio, please do have a look at these lovely pictures of Stockholm that we can see out of our window. Thank you, Arcadia and Clara. While listening to that song and reflecting on what the previous speakers have told us, I kept thinking about the following question. How do we achieve change? To move from words to actions, what is really standing in the way of building resilience faster? For this next segment, we're going to meet some doers, movers and shakers. We'll hear how they've been able to contribute to change and what their journeys have looked like. First up, we have a conversation between two extraordinary activists. Each represents a different generation from two different continents. 
Kumi Naidu formerly led Greenpeace International and Amnesty International. Nikki Becker is one of the founders of Fridays for Future in Argentina. Let's hear how they think we can achieve change. Hi, Nikki. It's such a pleasure to meet you. I've heard so many great things about you. I've seen your work with SWA and as a youth activist. I would love to hear more about what drives you, what pushed you to join the fight for climate justice. Was there a particular event, a moment that you can remember? Hi, Kumi. It's a pleasure to meet you. And yeah, well, at some point, I was always an activist. Uh, mm-hmm. My first march, when I, it was when I was very young, uh, in a Women's uh, International Day. But my activism for the climate justice uh, started uh, with a very centennial reason. Uh, I was on Instagram and I saw a video of young people in Europe calling for the first international strike on March uh, in 2019. And I I got very curious because nobody seems to be talking about the climate crisis here in Argentina. So I started to do some research and talk with some friends and we decided uh, okay, to, to to start looking information and the more I read, the more indication that I feel. And I decide one of the best decisions in my life to, to convert this indication into collective action. So I start talking with my friends and we decide to create a local expression of this uh, of this movement of Fridays for Future, but here in Argentina. And that's why we create Youth for Climate Argentina Jóvenes por el Clima Argentina, but with a, a human rights perspective and with a Latin American perspective, you know. And you, Kumi, because you're, you have been an activist and organizing for decades, and I want to know what pushed you to join the environmental movement. Well, first, I should say the fact that I've been involved for decades tells you what a bad job of my generation. <laughs> that the problem is still so bad. So we're looking to young people to bring fresh ideas to actually help us win. We need to leave back some of the old ideas. But for me, you know, embracing climate justice and environmental justice more generally was really about seeing the connection between things like water and human rights, um, access to land, understanding that in fact what people need to survive is very much taking care of nature. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think one of the challenges that we have is to uh, break down this myth that we only care about the trees because, yeah, of course, we care about the trees. But if you look in Google, the, the word climate change, for example, the first uh, picture that you will see, it's a polar bear. And yeah, the polar bear are uh, in danger of extinction. But I don't fight because of the polar bear. I fight because a million of people are already suffering the consequences, you know. Um, so I think what we did as a, as young people in, in a, at the point was to, um, like to uh, rethink the, the way to communicate the climate crisis and not just talk about degrees and numbers and about the future, but talk about the present and tell human stories uh, that, uh, that people that are already suffering the consequences right now. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. And that's why the climate justice uh, word is so important because it's a way to say, okay, yeah, <laughs> we care about the future, but the climate crisis is already in the present and more in the global south. And also to put the person at the center of what, what we talk. And I think that's a, at least one of the ways uh, to reach more people in, in our movement, you know, to, to make, to join, to more people to join our movement. And we need to build sort of movements that are inclusive, that uh, generate, you know, sustainable power and ensure that those in government and in the business sector cannot continue to drag the face, the feet 
whether it's in terms of delivering water and sanitation or whether it's addressing the climate justice question more broadly. Uh, like if you could uh, build your dream coalition, what it would be? Because I think uh, it's so important to, to think all interconnected, as you said, and to put the, the human at the center, the justice in the, at the center, you know? I know, what do you think about it? The dream coalition for me would be one, firstly, which in terms of its message will not be about what we have right now, which is all about system protection, system maintenance and system recovery. It should be one that is saying we need to have system innovation, system redesign and system transformation. Education system, economic system, transport system, food system, all of these systems require significant change. So a ideal coalition, a dream coalition would be one that asks the right question and answers the right question and doesn't fall into the trap of believing that we can address the problem by rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic while humanity is sinking. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes I feel that uh, the climate change is such a big issue that you feel that you can do anything. And I, I really like what you say because it's a lot of things that we can we can do because at some point hope is in the movement. I mean, hope is in, in the people. Let's use the very limited time that we have to actually turn things around and ensure that your generation can thrive, can prosper and can lead the world to more, more justice, more sustainability, more peace and generally a better life for all. Thank you so much, Nikki. It's been a real pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for, for this talk. And I also hope to see you in person soon. What a fantastic conversation. A reminder that building resilience requires us to listen to and work across generations. Thank you, Nikki and Kumi. Now we'll hear from the US government, which has an important role in harnessing the power of international cooperation to bring about positive change. Mr. Mark Feierenstein is principal advisor to the administrator of USAID. He's had a long career in public service to the US government, specializing in Latin American affairs. Earlier in his career, he was a journalist working as a reporter for the Mexico City News. Let's hear what he has to say. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. Can you tell us how your experiences have shaped your understanding of resilience? Well, first, thank you to the Stockholm International Water Institute for organizing this very important event. And I want to thank you, Aluk, for the kind introduction and taking the time to talk today. So I have a background in democracy and, and governance. And I've been involved in efforts over the years, past three decades, to help countries develop governance resilience by strengthening capacity of democratic institutions, by developing capable legislative branches, by allowing civil society to develop, by encouraging the growth of a free press. And then when there are challenges, economic, political, social, that these countries face, they can withstand with their democracies intact. I think there are lessons there economic development uh, efforts as well, including on water. What does resilience mean to U.S. aid? Well, building resilience is a smart long-term investment. It saves U.S. taxpayer money through averted humanitarian spending. At USAID, we're actively integrating resilience across all the agency's work. And when it comes to water, USAID goes beyond investing in climate resilient water and sanitation infrastructure to leverage the role of water in strengthening resilient systems more broadly. Now, water security is a powerful force to blunt the most severe impacts of climate change. Water security builds resilience by reducing conflict, it strengthens economies, it decreases disease, it improves food security, it slows migration, and it reduces the impact of natural disasters. So when we invest in water, we're really investing in resilience to climate change. And sanitation also plays a critical role in building resilience by improving water quality, by reducing disease and, and building equity. So building resilience is not just about the tap or the toilet or the number of people reached. It's about strengthening governance, about strengthening finance and the broader systems around water services. And we also must look upstream 
and strengthen water resource management as part of this broader system to secure these resources against future water-related shocks, such as floods and droughts. Now, we at AID are currently working, just to give you an example, we're currently working to close critical gaps in resilience financing and doing so in six countries in Asia and Africa. We've already helped mobilize more than $50 million from private and public sources to help build resilience through improved water and sanitation services, and we hope to build that and expand that, that kind of work around the world. How do you think that COVID-19 has raised the stakes for climate change and international cooperation? Well, the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change have reinforced the fact that we all rely on one another all over the globe. And whether we're relying on our neighbors to wear masks and get vaccinated helps slow the spread of COVID-19 or we're counting on the entire world to implement aggressive emissions reduction and adaptation strategies, we can't solve the problems we face today alone, either as individuals or as individual country. Now, water flows, diseases spread, economies move, and the climate changes, all without respect for international borders. So what happens in one country or to one marginalized group can affect the entire planet. So we need to work together to build our collective resilience as an international community. So for these reasons, COVID-19 and climate are at the forefront of all that we're doing at USAID now, including with regard to water. Our new climate strategy, which will be released at the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, will heavily feature water as a key to addressing the climate crisis. And our COVID-19 strategy recognizes the importance of water, sanitation, and hygiene, both for infection prevention and control of the disease, and as an essential service for, for preventing development and economic growth backsliding. In your view, what are the most important values that guide international cooperation for the U.S.? Well, while the United States can provide catalytic resources and technical expertise, we alone can't build the water secure world we want to see. And so we need to work hand in hand with our government partners, our private sector partners, our civil, our civil society and local community partners. And we approach international cooperation with the humility that we don't have all the answers. We recognize the best answers come from those closest to the challenge. So we need to harness the power of local expertise and innovation that we find in the places that we work all over the globe. And we're gonna learn as much as our, as our partners do from us. So we rely on guidance from our partner governments on how our resources and capabilities can be most transformative. And we support them to realize their own resilience objectives. Uh, we've seen this type of collaboration all over the world. And give me an example in the Philippines, for example, we've been working uh, with the country's national planning agency to close the data gaps that it identified as barriers to resilient water planning and management. And we're fortunate to have you know, good partners in government, the private sector, and civil society all over the world like that. Thank you very much, Mark. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Well, thank you again to the Stockholm International Water Institute for organizing this event and inviting us to participate. And thank you again, Aluk, for this terrific conversation. And we look forward uh, to sharing and learning a lot uh, during this, this critical event. Last but not least, we know that communication is a powerful tool for achieving change. Now, as a journalist myself, this is something that hits very close to home for me. Without communication, you achieve nothing. Good ideas and experiences have to be shared and communicated and ultimately, that's what provides the impetus for change, moves people to action. I'm honoured now to be joined by this year's winner of the Stockholm Water Prize, Sandra Postel, for a conversation about communicating about water to bring about change. Sandra is a leading conservationist and an expert on international water issues. Sandra, it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Thank you a lot. Pleasure to be here. Now, Sandra, you have a very multidisciplinary background, geology, political science, environmental management. What, what is it that led you to dedicate your career to water? Oh, I would say it was a mix of luck, labor, and love, really. Um, I've, I've always loved nature. And from the time I was a teenager, um, I knew I wanted to do something on behalf of the earth. Um, and right after graduate school, I received a job with a small firm and, 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 and worked on water conservation and on U.S. water policy. And I just got hooked on, on water. 
Then a few years later, um, I got very lucky when a research institute in Washington, D.C. hired me to take on global water issues. And I felt like I was completely in over my head, um, but I worked hard and I learned how to think holistically about water and how to research water in an interdisciplinary way, which, which wasn't very common back then. Uh, I also focused on writing in a scientifically sound way, but in a non-technical way, so that anyone interested in, in water, including policymakers, could learn and, and get engaged in the, in the issues. So in a way, it all came together for me. I, I found my niche, which is you know, the intersection of what we love and what we're good at. And I stayed with that. Now, for those people who perhaps don't um, understand um, or, or know much about water issues and environmental issues, how would you describe uh, what you do, what your work is? Well, that's a great question. Um, for pretty much my whole career, I've grappled with the fundamental question that if water is finite, it's essential to life, and there are no substitutes for it, then how can we ensure water security for humanity, but also for the amazing web of life that we're a part of and that we depend upon? How do we, how do, we do this? And this, of course, got me investigating how we can conserve and use water more efficiently in agriculture, in our cities, how we can improve the health of rivers, um, how we can manage water to both mitigate climate change and adapt to climate change. You know, water is so much more than a resource, so much more than a commodity. It is the basis of life, and yet we don't always manage water with that fundamental truth in mind. Now, in your latest book, uh, which is called Replenish, you argue that we need to change the approach we have to water, that we need to work more with natural flows and processes rather than against them. Can you just help us understand how you got to that understanding? Yeah, in, in the mid-90s, um, I had back-to-back -back experiences that showed me that we need a new approach to water. Uh, first, I visited the RLC in Central Asia as part of a fact-finding mission for the World Bank. And the RLC used to be the world's fourth largest lake, and it was disappearing because the rivers that sustained it had been diverted into the desert to grow cotton. Uh, and I saw firsthand, in a very, very visceral way for me, the connection between the health of an ecosystem and the health of the people and the communities and the economy that depend on that ecosystem. And then shortly after that, I had a similar situation in the Colorado River Delta in Mexico. Uh, the Delta was once a beautiful 800,000 hectare wetland, supported all kinds of, of wildlife. And, and birds, migratory birds depended on it. But the river upstream in the United States was so dammed and diverted that nothing was left for the river and its delta in Mexico. And so it had completely dried out and all that habitat was gone. And the way of life for the native Cocopa Indians was gone. So this was a big, big wake up call for me as a researcher that we need to really read um, how we use and value and manage water and begin to work more with natural processes to meet our, our, our goals and our needs rather than further disrupting them. So as you mentioned, I show in Replenish that there are a lot of ways we can do this. They're becoming, I think, more and more important uh, with the impacts of climate change hitting us so hard as, they, as we're seeing this year around the world. Um, and so, for example, as floods intensify, as we've just seen in Western Europe, um, what do we do? Do we raise the dams again? Do we raise the levees some more? Or do we begin to let the rivers reconnect with their natural floodplain? And if we do that, this will not only begin to mitigate floods and manage floods differently, it will capture carbon in the soil. It will recharge groundwater. It will create habitat for birds and wildlife. 
we just don't have time to solve these big challenges, these crises really of climate, water and biodiversity in a piecemeal fashion. We really need these solutions that can solve these existential challenges simultaneously. These are such big challenges, as you've outlined very eloquently. Um, but this, since we're talking about communication, how have you been able to share the things that you've learned in your career with other people? Um, and how do you inspire them into action? What tools do you use? Well, I, I write books. Uh, I write articles. I do a lot of public speaking and lectures, um, a lot of outreach. I also spent... Uh, six years. This was this was a wonderful part of my career. I spent six years as the freshwater fellow of the National Geographic Society, where I worked with a very creative team of people um, and developed tools that had a very broad reach um, to educate people about freshwater and and to get mo more people engaged in in freshwater. One tool that we developed that became very popular was a a freshwater footprint calculator that walked people through their their daily life and asked questions about their diet, their energy use, their shopping habits, their home water use, and it gave them tips on how they could shrink their personal water footprint uh, if they chose to do that. Um, I also hosted a, a blog called Water Currents that, um, that again was for a broad public and I invited other water experts to contribute to that blog. So we got stories and ideas out to the world from around the world, again, to raise more awareness. So it was a great opportunity um, you know, to spread the word about fresh water and get more people engaged. So here's what I'd like to ask you, Alec, if you're, you know, you're a journalist and you know quite a bit about, about water, I'd, I'd be curious to, to know what you consider uh, the most effective ways of, of raising awareness from your experience. Well, it's a good question. I mean, if you're th all the things you've talked about as a as a basically a one woman um, communications machine for water are so impressive that I feel like any any achievements I might have made <laughs> pale into insignificance. But I'll tell you one thing that I think have always always impresses me about the way that people understand complicated issues is if you make it about them. Um, very, very clearly. So when you were talking about your water footprint calculator, that's that's exactly the kind of thing I think I would find useful to, in telling people about how a town or a city's water footprint or water use is is kind of impacting the environment around them and how that could change, showing them scenarios of how that could change to give them ownership of the problem. Mm -hmm. People like to solve problems by themselves. And I think that telling people you have to do this, you have to do that, is not enough. I think that bringing people along with you um, is the art of general persuasion and gentle communication. And I think that's what I found to be the most useful thing, is to, is to empower people with knowledge so they can make their own decisions rather than making them feel bad about it. Mm. Um, and I think that's what I, I would normally go for, or I would try to go for. Uh, does, that sound, does that sound like a sensible uh, way of approaching things? Yeah, absolutely, I, I completely agree, yeah. Let me ask you one more question before I let you go. Sure. Um, how, how do you think each of us can contribute to the positive change on fresh water? Do we all need to be expert hydrologists to make a difference? We don't need to be expert hydrologists and we can all make a difference. Um, you know, each of us can look at our own consumption habits and, and make more water conscious choices if we want to. And if tens or hundreds of millions of us choose to do that, well, we're, we're on our way to some significant solutions. Um, in our local communities, where we all live, no matter where we live, we can push for more conservation, uh, more protection of rivers and streams. And I think perhaps most importantly right now, we can urge our, our political leaders to act more boldly, more urgently, uh, to mitigate climate change and, and adapt to the impacts of climate change. And we're seeing this so, so much this year. You know, and adapt to those impacts by investing in those nature-based solutions we've been talking about. You know, the theme of, of this year's World Water Week, building resilience faster, that is spot on. Uh, the climate science is clear that we are 
already locked into a world of more intense heat waves, more intense droughts and wildfires and floods. It's here. And the longer we wait to act, the less hospitable the planet will become. But I think this is very important. It's crucial that we remember that all is not lost. There's still a lot, if we act now, there's still a lot that, that we can save. Sandra, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Now, after that inspiring conversation, I'm really looking forward to tuning into the Stockholm Water Prize ceremony to learn more about Sandra's groundbreaking vision and work and to listen to the winner of the Stockholm Water Prize 2020, Dr. John Cherry. Now, as a friendly reminder, the prize ceremony will be aired on Wednesday at 4 p.m. Central European time. And I know I speak on Sandra's behalf when I say that we'll both be tuning in to the Stockholm Junior Water Prize uh, later on as well. That will be awarded tomorrow at 2 p.m. Central European time. Tune in to meet the next generation of innovators and changemakers. I'm joined again by Torgny Holmgren and Henrika Thomason to talk some more about the week ahead of us. Uh, welcome to Henrika and Torgny. Torgny, I'm curious to know what you thought of Sandra Postel's uh, message there. Well, I think the message of Sandra Postel has never been more important than we heard today. We really need to change our relationship with water, otherwise we will be in big trouble. But also very encouraging to listen to Sandra and others who come forward with a number of solutions for the future. By revaluing water, we can become the stewards of the planet. And I think that is what we in the water community and beyond should focus upon in the years to come. And this is what we will offer the World Water Week for also in the years to come. Henrika, what did you think? How, what did you take away from Sandra's message? Well, I am especially taken by the message that water cannot be seen only as a resource at our service. Personally, I think this is the real mental challenge that we stand before. It might seem like a paradox, but our survival depends on that we stop seeing ourselves as superior. Ecosystems need to exist in their own right. They have connections and hold intrinsic values that are beyond our understanding. Also, the need for urgent action, of course, I heard. We designed this year's World Water Week to be about action and impact. With the growing gaps between the rich and the poor and the climate crisis, it must be all hands on deck and a focus on real world solutions. So action is really important. How do you go about doing all of the things you just outlined? Well, first, the theme, building resilience faster, is very action-oriented in itself. Second, we have structured the program around five challenges especially important to address. And third, we are asking session organizers what they state as the most pressing actions. And finally, we have a team of dedicated rapporteurs that are listening in on sessions and reporting back to us on what they hear as actions and solutions so that we can follow up. So you talked about challenges. Togni, what are these challenges? Yeah, we have highlighted five challenges and just let me show you on the screen. The first is to build resilience and fair societies. We know that, for instance, the poor suffer most from climate change. But good water governance is one of the most powerful tools that we have to tackle that and also to make societies more resilient, irrespective if they have plenty or little of water. Number two, the second challenge is to work together with rather than against nature. In order to stay within the planetary boundaries, we need to do that. And I now see an increased interest in uh, green investments and nature-based solutions, be it for agriculture or city planning. However, such solutions need to be, um, take water much more into account in the future. Third, we need to transform our value chains and move towards a circular economy. Not even 10% of our total economy, global economy, is currently circular, according to this year's uh, report from the Circularity Gap Reporting Initiative. Number four, rethink our cities. By 2050, we know that 70% of global population will live in cities. So what happens there will have enormous consequences. 
Not least do we need to provide all city dwellers with clean water and safe sanitation. Last but not least, number five, invest in systemic change. That means adjusting incentives and innovations and institutions to support the required transformation of our societies. From what we heard today, there is a growing commitment to bull change. And let us together use this week to create a more climate resilient future together. So collaboration is clearly an important part of all of that. And it's very much in the spirit of World Water Week. Um, Henrika, what do you see as the most important factors for success here? Well, personal commitment, of course, that we really want to change. But I think we often underestimate the more practical aspects, such as having the right tools and the right knowledge, for example. And this is where I really see a role for World War Week, as a place to share tried and tested solutions that deserve to be more widely known and used. Another important factor for success is that our participants go get their networking passes so that they really can interact on our platform during the week. And World Water Week is promoting something called accelerators. Can you tell me what they are? Yes. Accelerators are perspectives providing skills that we believe are especially important in order to achieve change. And this year we are working with partners on two such perspectives. Together with Grund Foss Foundation, we have started the Communications Initiative. So there will be plenty of sessions on communication and behavioral skills. Personally, personally I think these skill sets are extremely important. They can help us change the world. Now that sounds like a lot of interesting stuff. Henry, Sorry, I have you have one more. more. Sorry, did I interrupt you? <laughs> Carry on. The other accelerator <laughs> focuses on leadership in business together with the government of the Netherlands. The business sector is becoming increasingly aware of how dependent they are on clean water and the role they have to play. But they are not yet aware enough. A fundamental shift is needed. Industries and governments must work together. So there will be important cross-sectoral conversations on this during the week in these accelerator sessions. That sounds like a lot of very interesting content. Thank you, Henrika and Torgny, for sharing that with us, which I think sums up very nicely what we can expect from this week. I'm sure that none of you who are attending this year's World War II Week will have missed the gravity of the challenge we face. But I hope that everyone who's joined me for this opening plenary also feels there's a growing sense of hope and determination. There are so many things already happening, as we've learned about today at World Water Week. And with that, I'd like to bring the opening plenary to a close. Thank you for joining me as we kick off this conference. And let's all meet again at the closing plenary on Friday. I wish you a wonderful experience at World Water Week 2021.